Thank you, Jeff, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a real joy and privilege to be at Norwegian Settlers this morning. I trust the sound is coming through all right, is it? Good. Uh, Jeff referred to the rugby yesterday. What he didn't say was how much more difficult it is to preach when my team has lost. <laughs> Even when it's the Sharks and they've lost, I feel really down. <laughs> but I'm sure the Lord will undertake. I want to read from two scriptures, firstly from the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 4, and this is the passage that has been given to me, 2 Kings chapter 2, chapter 4 and verse 42, and then I'm going to jump over into the New Testament um, to the feeding of the 5,000. 2 Kings 2 and verse 42. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God, that's Elisha, 20 loaves of barley bread, baked from the first ripe corn, along with some heads of new corn. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha said, give it to the people to eat. For this is what the Lord says, they will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. And then I'm going across to Mark chapter 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and I'm going to read from Mark 6 and verse 35. The story is the feeding of the 5,000 that's very well known. Um, Mark 6, verse 35. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he, Jesus, answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we, are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. My wife Anne likes those television programs, and there are a couple of them, where people come with some of their furniture and they have it evaluated. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Sometimes it's a coin, sometimes it's a vase, sometimes a coffee table, a painting, whatever. And something that often looks very old and uh, meaningless on the outside is a judge to be worth thousands of pounds, sometimes tens of thousands of pounds. And so what was happening all along is that the people were actually sitting on a fortune. And something that looked as if it was valueless, actually was shown to be of great value. In a sense, every one of those objects was containing a little miracle. I heard of a church, I can't remember where, in fact, I think it applies to more than one church, where there was an oldest man who used to come week by week in rather shabby clothes, and no one really got to know him until the day he died and he was buried and he left millions of rand to that particular church. And so concealed in this man was indeed a financial miracle. 
You know, we say quite often, don't judge a book by its cover, because very often inside it, a miracle is lurking. And so I want to speak this morning on the topic, there's a miracle in every loaf. But we need to look for it. We need to look at it. We need to look sometimes beyond the rather old and unimpressive exterior to see the miracle that is contained within it. So often the extraordinary things of God's kingdom and of God's power are concealed underneath rather impressive or unimpressive exteriors. Now the passage I was assigned was 2 Kings chapter 4, the feeding of the hundred. And the moment I read it, I was struck by the fact that I've never seen it before, that there's a rather remarkable parallel with the feeding of the 5,000. And that's why I've read both of these passages, because we see the same truths within it. Now, I think that uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 is a rather straightforward story. A man comes to the great prophet Elisha with a gift. And the gift is 20 loaves of freshly baked barley bread, and with it some fresh corn. Now, just as Elijah before him had had disciples called the school of the prophets under him, so Elisha, his successor, also was the founder, was the head of the school of prophets. <laughs> and so when they received this gift, he had about a hundred prophets in the school. It must have been a welcome gift. It certainly would have fed a few, but not a hundred people. And so Elisha says to his servant, give it to the prophets to eat. And I think the servant responds in a way that we all would have done, but, but this is not enough. I can't feed a hundred people with this. Won't it be embarrassing if we feed just a few and most of the people have nothing? And so there's not enough, the servant says to Elisha. Elisha says, this is what the Lord says. They will eat and some will be left over. And so he told the servant to distribute the loaves, which he did as the people were broken up into groups. And uh, the Bible says they all ate and they ate heartily. And there was some left over according to the word of the Lord. This was a miracle. The miracle was that only 20 loaves were brought. It wasn't enough to feed everyone. But in a sense, there was a miracle inside every loaf because as the loaves were distributed, so they were multiplied. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 is also very well known. There were about 10,000 people in a semi-desert area. The disciples are anxious because it's coming to the close of day. They know that this is rather a remote area. And uh, so they say, there are no shops, there's nowhere to get food. The responsibility will be ours. Send them away so that they can go and buy their own food. Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. They respond in exactly the same way as Elisha's servant did. How can we do that? How can we so many people? And then Jesus asks his disciples, how many loaves do you have? And they go and look and they bring back five loaves and two small tiny fishes, a little boy's lunch, and they say, this is what we have. Jesus, the scripture says, looked up to heaven, gave thanks to God, took the loaves and the fish, and he broke them, and he broke them, and he broke them. And the food was distributed to the people who had been divided up into groups. And so the scripture says there too, they all ate and they were satisfied. And when the disciples collected up the remainder, the remnants afterwards, they filled 12 basketfuls. Now there's an obvious parallel 
And uh, I should imagine that most of the people in the feeding of the 5,000 didn't even know a miracle had taken place. But some of the disciples must surely have. And I wonder whether some of them thought back to Elisha and how Elisha had distributed uh, the 20 loaves. And some of them must have asked themselves, who is this? Who is this man? Is this now the reincarnation of the prophet Elisha? I want to take three very straightforward lessons and apply them to us this morning. The first is this, and you should be able to follow it nicely. Firstly, God provides our daily bread. God provides our daily bread. In verse 40, uh, 42 of 2 Kings 4, God provided for Elijah and for every one of the hundred prophets. God provides us, my friends, with everything that we have. Everything that you have at home, everything you bring with you, everything you have accumulated down through the years is actually God providing for us our daily bread. Can you remember what Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Not really the Lord's Prayer, but the disciples' prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. We're praying, Lord, give us today's bread today. That's what it means. Give us today's bread. And God does so. And so when you eat your cornflakes in the morning, or in my case, all bran flakes, you don't just say, oh, well, this is a very nutritious meal, and uh, this is, you know, what my salary has paid for, etc. Look at it and say, God has answered my prayer. I prayed, give today's bread to me today. This is your provision for me. That's why we should say grace. That's why we should ask a bl the blessing, whatever you call it. Because it's not just ours. It's not just food. It's God answering the prayer that his son taught us to pray. My favorite song uh, of the last 15 years or so is what a faithful God have I. And then in the older version, the old traditional hymn, uh, great is thy faithfulness, and you'll know, I'm sure, some of you, how the chorus goes, all I have needed, your hand has provided. Let me tell you a story. It's a story about a man whose name is Stan Daniels. He died a year or two ago. He's um, quite a bit older than I am. He is the, was the pastor of Haderfeld Church. When I was the principal of the Baptist College in Cape Town, he came into one chapel service and he said, I want to give a testimony about what happened yesterday. He said, when I came to the college, he said, I knew we didn't have any food at home. And he said, I still had to go to the seminary. And so that is what he did. When he was there, his wife phoned him and said, do you know we've got no food for ourselves and for our children? He said, well, there's nothing I can do. We we'll just pray. We will pray again that God would provide what we need. When Stan Daniels left the, cemetery, uh, the seminary, not the cemetery, <laughs> he's in the cemetery now, <laughs> but he wasn't there. <laughs> He was driving along the road towards Mitchell's Plain and he turned into a road called Holt Road, if I remember correctly. He was traveling behind a bocce, a bocce which took the corner rather too quickly. And as the bocce went round the corner, so uh, the back doors came open and a whole lot of things fell into the road. And uh, Stan Daniels, stopped his vehicle because they were in danger of running over them. And there were about 10 loaves of bread. And he picked up those loaves of bread and he said, thank you God for answering the prayer that we pray. It's Stan Daniels. About five years ago, Stan Daniels, whom I hadn't spoken to for about 15 years, our paths had just gone in different directions, he phoned me and he said, Pastor Peter, the Lord told me to pray for you. In the night, he told me to pray for you. 
And uh, I said, how did you know? He said, no, I didn't know anything. I was going through a particularly difficult time in the ministry. And here was Stan Daniels being God's provision to me of the encouragement that I needed at that time. Now he's gone to be with the Lord and he is in the cemetery. My friends, God's provision is wonderful and his grace is sufficient. In fact, his grace is more than sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you. Let me tell you a true story. This time it's about myself. 28 years ago, I underwent a triple heart bypass. It was totally unexpected. There were none of the six or seven symptoms they looked for. There aren't to this day. It was a kind of thing that medically was inexplicable. That's what the surgeon said. That's what the specialist said. This thing suddenly came. I needed to, to have a triple bypass overnight. Uh, obviously, it was rather an anxious time for Anne and for myself and the family because we had small children then. And, um, and Anne had accompanying her on the day that I had the bypass. They used to take five or six hours uh, when my operation was performed was a missionary called Agnes de Smith. Some of you might know of her. And she encouraged Anne, and she left with Anne a nicely written note that actually had a text, my grace is sufficient for you. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. And then every year on the anniversary of my bypass, she used to write a note to us, and she used to quote the same verse, my grace is sufficient for you. So we've got a plaque that we put in our lounge that actually reads, my grace is sufficient for you. Anne went to the doctor, uh, Dr. Robin White, and she said to him, how on earth did you pick up the fact that there was any problem with Peter because I had no outward symptoms whatever? He responded, it was only the grace of God. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is more than sufficient. John 1 verse 16, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. That's the literal translation. The word in Greek is epi, which either means upon, on top of, or it means in place of. And so grace upon grace, one grace on top of another, one grace replacing another. The best illustration I could think of was the waves that wash up onto the beach. I'm sure some of you have watched them. I mean, we can see waves here. And you will see a wave coming onto the beach and the wave that has been quite strong and then it loses its power. And the wave dies and it, at its zenith, it disappears into the sand. But as that happens, so another wave replaces it, and another wave, and another wave, wave upon wave upon wave upon wave, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. God provides our daily bread. The second lesson I want to extract is this. God multiplies the loaves that we bring. Now look in verse 43 of 2 Kings 4. The story of Elisha was a miracle. God multiplied the loaves. The feeding of the 5,000 was a miracle. To the 10,000 people, the five loaves and the two fish were multiplied and all of them met. But I want you to notice something. God didn't perform a miracle out of nothing. Elisha didn't just say, oh God, provide for all the people. Elisha took the gift of 20 barley loaves. Jesus took the contribution of a little lad's lunch. He took the five loaves and the two fishes. Elisha took the loaves. Jesus took the loaves and the fishes. And he performed a miracle out of what had been brought. 
Elisha used the barley loaves of a generous man. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes of a young boy. Verse 42, Elisha says, give it. In other words, give what we have got to the people. Mark 6, verse 37, Jesus says, give them something to eat. When they say, how can we do that? He says, how many loaves do you have? You see, God doesn't ask us to bring what we don't have. Jesus tells us to bring what we have. Jesus says, feed the 10,000. God said to Elisha, and Elisha said to his servant, feed the hundred. Now I see at the back of the church there, taking the church outside its walls. That's dangerous. What about all the people? What about all the suburbs? What about all the, the material needs? Jesus says, bring to me all that you have. What do you have? Can you remember, God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? And Moses looked, and I'm sure he was tempted to say, I don't have anything. But it wasn't true. He looked and he saw, I've got a staff, I've got a rod. And God said, give me that rod and see what I will do with it. And the scripture says that in his hand, it became the rod of God. John Bunyan was imprisoned in an English jail in Bedford. And he heard God saying to him, what do you have in your hand? And he thought at first, God, I've got nothing. I'm imprisoned. I'm in jail. But he did have something. He had a pen and he had a quill and he had ink. And he had a good knowledge of the king's English. And he had a wonderful experience of God. And when he brought what he had to God, God took that pen and that ink and his experience of the Christian life, and he wrote the story, Pilgrim's Progress. And so I want to point out to you, it is our loaves that God uses. The loaves of a generous benefactor. How can we impact the community? How can we go out and reach the world for Jesus? God says to us, bring what you have to me. Now, I don't know what you have. Perhaps you have a good bank balance. Perhaps you've got a, a good job. Perhaps you've got musical ability. Perhaps you can play the instrument. Everyone likes to play the drums, don't they? I don't know why. Drums are so popular among young people. Everyone likes to bang the drums. What do you have in your hand? You say, Lord, uh, uh, I've got a good speaking voice. Bring it to the Lord. I've got a friendly personality. I've got a generous heart. Bring what you have to God, even if it seems to be little, and God will multiply it. It's our loaves, but it's his word. I wonder whether you notice verse 43. Elisha says, this is what the Lord says. In verse 44, according to the word of the Lord, what has the Lord said to you as a church? What has he said to you personally? What do you know God has said to you? It's the word of the Lord that must dictate what we do and what our priorities are. It's his word. It's his provision. This wasn't Elisha's magic. Elisha didn't say, hula, 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 and perform a, a, a miracle. It wasn't Elisha's miracle. It was God's miracle. It was God's provision. Jesus fed the 5,000, and he showed that God's kingdom was coming in him, in, him, in his ministry, in his life. Let me tell you something from my own experience, too. When I was a youngster, I grew up uh, in Durban, the Morningside side of Durban. There was a pastor called William Dumas who lived in, um, and ministered in Umgaini Road. He was a very unimpressive minister. He spoke English haltingly, but God gave to him the greatest gift of healing that I have ever known. Towards the end of his life, people would fly across the continent 
from America to ask him to pray for them. He prayed for my brother who had polio in the 1950s, in the polio epidemic at that time. And so I knew Pastor Duma. Pastor Duma was in our house on a number of occasions. And we were intrigued because I remember on one occasion I was in central Durban and I heard a woman come, I saw a woman come to him with a, with a thumb that was swollen terribly. And uh, she asked him to pray. Said, I, I can't do that. The Lord hasn't shown me yet. But we were intrigued. Uh, in his official biography, there were two people for whom he prayed who had been pronounced dead medically who were raised to life. And so we used to ask Pastor Dumas, tell us about this. This is wonderful. He would never, ever speak. He would, and the name of his biography is Take Your Glory, Lord. He said, no, I can't speak about it. To God be the glory. Take your glory, Lord. And so, my friends, I say, bring your loaves, even though they might seem very inadequate, and God will multiply them. Thirdly and finally, God reveals himself in Jesus. God reveals himself in Jesus. In verse 43, Elisha is speaking in such a way that he knows that what is about to happen is that God will reveal that his word is true. And so that's why he says, according to the word of the Lord. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus looked up to heaven. Why? Because he knew that God had provided and he knew that he was doing a godly thing. He was doing it in response to God the Father. And he knew that as he did this, people would look at him and say, what has God done in this man? Jesus was showing what God was like and what God could do. And my friends, God has revealed himself fully, finally, completely, and personally in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 and verse 2, uh, in many and varied ways, God spoke in times past through his servants, the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken through a son. The great philosopher Plato said, oh, if only God could come down and walk down through the streets of Athens. That's what Jesus did when he came to earth. People say to us, show me God at work. Show me a miracle. What we can do is to show them Jesus. Because in Jesus we see the face of God. In Jesus we hear the heartbeat of God. In Jesus and from Jesus we hear the word of God. Elisha was a great prophet, but Jesus was greater than Elisha. Elisha performed great miracles as God exercised his power through him. So Elisha was a great prophet, but Jesus was greater. Elisha spoke with power and passion. So did Jesus. But Jesus was also without sin. Jesus was both God and man. Jesus showed us who God was in who he was. Can you remember when he took the disciples into the mountain Caesarea Philippi? He asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And do you remember how they answered? They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say that you're John the Baptist, uh, one of the Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In who he was and is, Jesus is greater than Elijah. Jesus showed us God in what he said. Elisha spoke the word of God with power. Jesus spoke God's word with power and love. He was full of grace and truth. So that people said, no one has ever spoken like this man. Jesus not only said, I'm giving you bread to eat. Eat the loaf. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You need to eat me spiritually. You need to allow me to become part of you. And then my life 
will live in you. Jesus showed us God in what he did. Elisha fed a hundred. Jesus fed 10,000. Elisha was a spiritual man. Jesus was a sinless man. Elisha was a great prophet, among the greatest of the prophets. Jesus was the unique Son of God, who not only lived a unique life, not only died a sacrificial death for us, but he's the only person who was raised from the dead to live forever and ever. And so I ask the question, what do you have in your hand? How many loaves do you have? And I ask you carefully, look carefully at the loaves. Look carefully at the loaves because they are God's provision for you. And if you will bring them, he will break them and he will multiply them. If we look carefully, there's a miracle in every loaf. And so when you tuck into your Sunday dinner, I don't know what that will comprise. Fish and chips? <laughs> Maybe you're too busy in the worship group and you'll just go and get a takeaway from somewhere, Kentucky or whatever, dreadful food. Um, perhaps you're privileged. Perhaps it's a, a nice juicy piece of rump steak. Oh, that's my favorite. Steak and chips and, and some mushrooms. I say, don't just see the steak. If you're very privileged, you will, have, you will have lamb and you will have some roast potatoes. Don't just see the lamb and the roast potato. See it as God's provision. There is a miracle in every life. But we need to look carefully. We need to look carefully to see the miracles of God. But bring your loaves. Because if we do, there will be more than enough there will be some left over for everyone. And we will be able to minister, not just to our own little circle or to our own church, but to many, many others who are outside. More than enough for everyone. Because, my friends, His grace is more than sufficient. Thank you, God our Father, for the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we see personally in him. Thank you that every day you feed us not only with loaves of bread, but that with everything that is necessary for life and for godliness. Help us, Lord, not to keep all of this to ourselves. Please help us to constantly be asking ourselves and hearing the challenge of Jesus, give them something to eat. May we do so in Jesus' name and in the power of God. Amen.